This is Colin O'Keefe for LXBN TV, and today's topic of conversation is Facebook cybersecurity disclosures in advance of its IPO. Joining me is Craig Hoffman, partner at Baker Hostetler and author on the firm's blog, The Data Privacy Monitor. Uh, Craig, starting off a bit, can you can you talk a little about the prevalence of cybersecurity language in Facebook's Form S1? Sure, Colin. The Wall Street Journal accounted for us and said that the word privacy appeared 35 times. Uh, from a more substantive level, they identify three or four key disclosures that relate to cybersecurity risks and or privacy risks. A couple of the key ones, obviously advertising revenue is important to Facebook, and if there are changes in laws that affect its ability to collect and transfer its users' data to advertisers, uh, that could have an impact. So again, these are forward-looking issues, not issues that exist now, mm -hmm. but looking for what could happen that might inf impact Facebook's viability. That's one. Uh, one of the key things that struck me in their disclosure was their disclosure that Facebook is subject to complex laws both in the U.S. and abroad. And I think, obviously, as they all say in a different part of their S1, they expect their growth in the U.S. to slow and they're focusing more on growth abroad. It, the laws in foreign countries are much stricter uh, than the U.S. is on privacy laws. Now, the U.S. is constantly proposing new laws that might in, impose privacy restrictions on Facebook. They haven't passed yet, but in the EU there are existing laws and Facebook has encountered some problems in Ireland where its international operations are based and with the regulators in Germany. Mm -hmm. And with the new proposed EU laws uh, and the significant financial penalties that it might carry uh, set to come online in two years if enacted, uh, Facebook could face significant pressure there. Um, the other part uh, that they've disclosed is the regulatory investigation and lawsuit issue, both for privacy practices uh, and advertising practices. Uh, so obviously Facebook is one of the first or second most visited websites in the U.S., so it has a big target on its back, uh, especially by consumer privacy advocates. Uh, so when the end of last year it entered into a consent order with the FTC, it has to have a biannual audit for the next 20 years. If it violates any of those audit uh, consent order provisions, then it could face additional pressure. Uh, you know, it could also face pressure uh, from the Irish Data Commissioner or the German Data Commissioner. So those are kind of some of the key disclosure issues. Uh, obviously, there are individual user privacy issues, but none on the scale that would rise to the materiality that they're talking about with the company-wide disclosures. Mm -hmm, definitely, and you touched on it a little bit with you know what's going on in Germany and also with the FTC case. You know, what's Facebook's history with, with cybersecurity and privacy in terms of past problems? And then, you know, how big a threat does this pose to Facebook, obviously one of the, the world's most valuable companies? Overall, Facebook's goal, like any company, is to keep its current users and attract new users. And they say in their disclosure that if our, if our reputation or our practices, you know, the new products we roll out, cause our consumers to think either we don't protect their information or there's some other danger to giving their information and using it on Facebook, they're not going to retain their users and not, they're not going to attract new ones. If they can't find ways to comply with regulations abroad, they're not going to be able to retain new users in foreign countries. Mm -hmm. So from a cybersecurity standpoint, I'm not aware of any publicized large-scale data breaches that have occurred at, at Facebook and Facebook says in their disclosure they're moving towards managing their own technical infrastructure on their own instead of relying on third parties. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of have a good and a bad. Bringing it in-house gives them more control uh, because one of the most common points of a data breach is when you're using a third-party vendor. You may, be, you may have your house in order, but the people you rely on to help you may not, and that breach happens there and it affects you. But you know, if there's a, a learning curve while well, Facebook sets up its own technical infrastructure, you know, obviously humans operate the system and everyone's subject to human error so they could have a problem there. That's one of their forward-looking disclosures. Uh, although they haven't had a data breach, they do say that they've had instances of malware viruses 
computer hacking and phishing mm -hmm. in their system, and they expect people to continue to try that in the future. I think back in November of 2011, there were reports of spam where people were compromising user accounts and using those compromised accounts to send out explicit content that showed up in the news feed. Mm -hmm. uh, they put a stop to it quickly, but that's the kind of forward-looking problem they're concerned with. Um, and overall, from kind of a privacy approach, from the regulatory side with Facebook, they kind of pride themselves on being on the vanguard, introducing things that people may not have thought of, may not have appreciated, or even knew they wanted, but as soon as they use it, they like it. Yeah. And so sometimes they kind of have two steps forward, one step back. When their, their new feed was first released, people didn't like it, they thought it was cluttered, or they, they didn't like seeing what other people were doing or knowing that other people could see what they were doing. And now I, I think most people who use Facebook couldn't imagine it without the news feed. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, for each new product launch that turns out really well, they have a couple that didn't go so well, like its Beacon program. And it, if you don't get the rollout right, you don't get the privacy kind of baked into it when you start, you run into problems, and that's what Facebook has seen in the past. So you know, incrementally, it, it makes advancements. Uh, but by doing that, sometimes they, they run into problems. Yeah, I think that'll be really interesting to watch because with these new things flow in, both in their features, both their own first in-party applications and features and the third-party developers developing applications, it's going to be interesting to watch those things in particular. Uh, lastly, you know, you mentioned in, in your post on this subject that these disclosures that Facebook makes may set the tone for future companies when it comes to following, you know, the SEC's guidance on undisclosure for cybersecurity cyber and that type of thing. You know, can you briefly describe, you know, what the SEC advises along those lines and how Facebook uh, kind of follows along those lines? Sure. And there, just to be clear, there's no explicit requirement by the SEC to make disclosures about cybersecurity risks. But what they did issue last year was guidance that if there are certain factors in your business that would make an investment in your company risky or speculative, you know, the kind of material risks that investors should know about, they gave guidance on the type of risk factors you might want to disclose. So if, if you're a significant online presence and you, you rely heavily on the collection of user information uh, and those networks and you rely on third parties to maintain them, uh, the type, you know, especially if you're seeing people attempting to get access to your network, that type of forward-looking risk factor is what they're kind of giving guidance on disclosing. And so what you see in Facebook's S1, you have a company with a very high valuation expected at its IPO, and you have some of the best law firms in the country advising it on how to make those disclosures. So you know a lot of time and thought went into how to properly make the forward-looking disclosures, and you would expect then, with that kind of talent and time put into it, this would be the kind of work product that other companies, when they're filling out their S1s or they're making their disclosures going forward, would look at as an example of what you know, a good model disclosure would be. And I, I think it, it comes through pretty clearly in their disclosures. These are the forward-looking risks we anticipate. None of them are terribly surprising, but it puts it in black and white and it gives investors something objective to look at and evaluate the company by. Yep, it's going to be interesting to watch as, as privacy and cybersecurity become more and more a part of our daily lives. Companies are going to have to take that into account as they, you know, expand their businesses, as they look for investors, as they, you know, just try to att attract potential buyers. It's, it's just going to be interesting to watch. Uh, once again, that's Craig Hoffman of Baker Hotstetler and the Data Privacy Monitor. For more on this story, be sure to visit dataprivacymonitor.com and, of course, lxbn.lexblog.com. Thanks, Craig. Thank you, Colin. I appreciate it.